Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Savior Jesus to worship here at Living Shepherd. It's a joy to gather together with you this morning. We are wrapping up our worship series that we've been doing for these last few weeks this morning. We've been talking about our greatest needs. And through these last few weeks, we've seen how our Savior meets those greatest needs. We've seen how he's given us victory, faith, hope, and sight. And this weekend, we get to see how he gives us, how he addresses one of our greatest needs, and that is life. Because you know that death is all around us in this world. And you might even see evidence of it in your own life as you feel yourself aging, as your body weakens and decays. There is no avoiding death. And yet we get to see how our Savior gives us life. May God bless your worship today and every day. Our opening hymn is printed for you on page three. I pray, Lord, come. Let's sing the first two verses together. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. I guess this works. I'll try to ignore the comment about aging that you had earlier. Uh, our first reading for today is from Paul's epistle to the Romans, specifically the Christians in Rome. Um, I put a little title on this called The Spirit is Life. And this was written by Paul in the mid in the mid fifties A.D. Uh, before he ever had gone to Rome, he, uh, and he didn't really know anybody there, but he was looking forward to going, and had heard some good things about the growth of the Christian church in Rome. So he was pretty excited, and he laid out this epistle to the Romans, the Christians there. Uh, we're going to do some verses in one of the chapters. And he ended up writing in, in his epistle to the Romans what is one of the most highly regarded uh, expositions of the gospel, one of the most complete in the entire Bible. So the book of Romans is a good lesson for all of us if we want to get an encapsulized view of, of the gospels. So... Here's Paul speaking to the Christians in Rome. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we be also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. This is the end of the reading. Let's continue now by speaking the words of Psalm 103 responsively. They're printed for you on pages 5 and 6. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As a father has compassion on his children, 
For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. And his righteousness with their children's children. Please rise for the gospel. The gospel reading for today is from the book of John and concerns the raising of Lazarus, a story with which we're pretty familiar. Um, This is chapter 11, beginning with verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now we skip ahead to verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave gloves, grave clothes, and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Praise to you, O Lord Christ. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn 353. That's found in the red hymnals that should be in the racks beneath the chairs in front of you. Hymn 353, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness.
portion of God's word that we'll use for our sermon this morning is 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a longer reading. It's the story of the raising of the Shunammite woman's son. So chapter 4, verses 8 through 37. One day Elisha went to Shunam, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day Elisha came. And he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, Tell her, You have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, well, she has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. But the woman became pregnant. In the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said? Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon the boy, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed down to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. This is the word of our God. It was a Tuesday morning, 8.30 in the morning, about six years ago. 
My wife and I were walking on the track at the YMCA, and there were probably another 50 or so people there. Uh, The room was cluttered with the sounds of exercise, the mechanical whirring of treadmills, the stomp of jogging feet, the metallic scraping of barbells, and all of that to the backdrop of classic rock and the speakers coming out of the walls and the, the sound of the morning news on the TVs that were there. It was an ordinary Tuesday morning. And then there was a a loud noise. It sounded like a bunch of weights being dropped on the floor. It wasn't more than 20 or 30 feet away from us that a man collapsed on a treadmill and rolled to the ground. Two women who were nearby quickly rushed over to him and, and said, Call 911. And from that moment on, the room just became eerily quiet. All the machines stopped. All the jogging and running stopped. And everyone stood and watched the scene that was unfolding on that rubber weight room floor. Sarah and I watched for about the next 30 minutes as the two women and then the paramedics performed CPR on the man. We listened as the rescue personnel alternated between compressions and breaths as they searched for a pulse. And then we watched as the man was intubated, lifted onto a stretcher, and rolled from the room, still with no sign of life. It's a terrible thing to watch death stretch out its hand and grab someone. It's unnatural, it's ugly, it's frightening. Because even if you don't know the man who's laying on the floor getting CPR, you know what death does, and you know that all too well, too. Watching death brings to mind all of those terrible thoughts and feelings. You think of the tragedy of shortened lives, a man maybe in his 50s exercising, trying to stay healthy, And he sees what's probably his last Tuesday morning. You think of the survivors and how their lives are cracked and broken from that moment on. Did this wife, did this man have a wife? Children, family? Where were they when they got that phone call? And then you think of the eerie freakishness of a lifeless body as color drains away as movement stops and then as silence settles in. It's unnatural. It's ugly. It's no less unnatural and no less ugly for this woman from Shunem in our reading this morning. She had no children. And in fact, she hadn't even asked for them. Then God gave her a son and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And he went out to be with his father one day, and he gets a headache, and he says, my head, my head, and then he runs back, taking it back to his mother, and he falls asleep on her lap, and there he dies in her arms. This is no ordinary Tuesday. This is not natural. This is not pretty. This is not the way things are supposed to be. In the face of what is unnatural and ugly, of what is not the way it's supposed to be, our world can offer only second-rate comfort. The author George Orwell said this, The dead are never really dead to us until we have forgotten them. It sounds nice, but it's meaningless when you are the one who has to drop a handful of dirt onto the casket or when you have to go through your child's closet. The Roman statesman Cicero said this, the life of the dead is placed in the memory of the living. That sounds nice too. But it's meaningless when you just want to call up your dad and talk to him again or get a hug from him. 
forever in our memories, forever in our hearts. Those are the mantras that are carved onto so many tombstones. And it's meaningless when the thought of tomorrow is overwhelming. And you wish that the world would stop because this isn't the way it's supposed to be. It's not right. You want to scream. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Maybe that's something you've known for a long time. Death comes with its complicated finalities, stealing not just the people we love, but also tainting our thoughts and our emotions and our memories, hitting us hard in the guts with that undeniable fact We are all dying. We all have to face this reality. It's one thing to see it at the YMCA or to know it in your own family or even to have it set before you in a painful and traumatic and personal way, sort of like this woman from Shunem. But it's another thing entirely to remember exactly why death is this unnatural, ugly reality for all of us. God explains why in the Bible. In fact, he uses the Apostle Paul to help us understand why. We had a reading from this book of Romans earlier this morning. Here's another short reading from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that explains why death is the reality. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. Death is this awful, ugly, unnatural reality because of sin. And even though it was that first sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that caused death, their guilt and their shame has been passed down to us. So we face the ugly reality of death because of the ugly reality of our sin. And if you've ever thought that we don't do a very good job of talking about death, boy, it's the same for the cause of death, isn't it? We don't do a very good job of talking about sin. Without our sin, our selfishness, our grudges, our violence, our abuse, our lies, our manipulation, without that, there would be no death. Without the collective moral failure of humanity and without my specific sinful disobedience, we would not have the unnatural, ugly, and awful reality of death. It is a terrible thing to realize that my sin is the problem. To admit that I have earned the cold, ugly reality of death. It's terrible. It is not okay. So how in the world, how in the world can this woman from Shunem, who just lost her only child, say, everything is all right? When that woman responds to Elisha and Gehazi, she actually speaks just one simple word. It's four words in English, but it's just one word in the Hebrew. And it's probably a word that you know or have heard before. The word is shalom. It's a familiar word because that's often used as a greeting or even a farewell in the Old Testament among God's people, even among Jews to this day. It's often translated as meaning peace, but there is so much more to that word. And there is so much more to this woman's assessment than a simple pious hope for peace. This isn't just, there, there, everything will be okay, I'm sure it'll work out. The word shalom has this fundamental idea of everything being right, everything being settled and even everything being in the right place. 
That's peace. That things are the way they are supposed to be, the way that God wants them to be. Did you notice what this woman does when her son dies? She sets him on a bed, but not his bed. She puts him on the bed of the man of God, the prophet who had so often visited her family and shared the word of God with them. Why do you think this woman recruits a servant, loads a donkey, and rushes out the door? Because she's going to find the same man of God, the prophet whom she knows will yet again share with her all that God promises to do for her. And where does this woman finally meet him? Falling at his feet with tears in her eyes? She finds him at Mount Carmel. The very place where God had consumed with fire the false prophets of Baal, where God had shown that he is a God unlike any other. And that's why she can say everything is all right. Because her God is unlike any other. He always has been. Now make no mistake, this is a wonderful miracle that we get to see here in the Old Testament. This miracle that God does through the hands and through the prayers and through the staff of Elisha. But the miracle that comes before it is just as great. The fact that this woman knows she has a God unlike any other. And she knows that that God brings true shalom even when her son is dead. That's your God, too. Unlike any other, your God laid out his own son. Not in a bed, though. He laid him in the dust of death, just like he promised to do in the Garden of Eden, in the scroll of Isaiah, in the throne room of King Solomon. Your God sent this Messiah to rush out and to relentlessly obey every single word that came from his father's mouth, telling him to do whatever it takes to save you. Your God allowed Jesus to breathe his last, to cry out in agony, to have no one rush to his side and try to help and say, call 911 but to willingly give up his life to pay for your sin. Your God reveals that he is a God unlike any other, and he doesn't just do that at Mount Carmel. He does that at Mount Calvary, too. And that's how your God gives true shalom. Your sins are forgiven. You are at peace with God. You are in a right, even place with your God. And you have a guaranteed home in heaven. And all of that remains true and unchanging even when death slinks into your life and tries to steal away what you love most. Your God does not promise to raise your child, to raise your father, your sister, your friend back to life right now. He doesn't promise to do that, even though he absolutely could. He has the power, and this story shows it. What your God promises to do is this. He will raise your child, your father, your sister, your friend, and all of those who trust in his glorious grace on the last day. Death is not the end. For believers, for those who know and trust their Savior, death is simply another way for God to reveal how he has made everything right, how he has put everything in its right place, how he gives real, true, and lasting shalom. And maybe that's something you've known for a long time too. 
doesn't mean that death isn't hard. It is. doesn't mean that there aren't tears and grief and mourning and loss. There is. And it doesn't mean that going to the cemetery to pay your respects is going to be easy. It won't. But it does mean that when you do go to the cemetery, maybe you can remember what that word cemetery actually means. That word cemetery comes from a Greek word, and it means sleeping house. That's really what this story teaches me, isn't it? Death is a sleep from which your gracious God will one day wake you so that you get to enjoy the life of the world to come. The words we speak in the Apostles' Creed. It is a terrible thing to fear death. But thankfully, you don't have to. Because of what your Savior does for you on the cross, you need not worry about a Tuesday morning at the YMCA or a long losing battle with cancer or a freak car accident on your way home from church. Your Savior's perfect work for you guarantees your perfect standing with God. Be like this Shunammite. Set all your fears and worries and grief on the bed of your God. Run to his word, to hear his comfort, to hear his promises, and then fall at his feet, trusting that he knows and does what is best for you always. And as you do all that, take some time to be like Elisha, too. Be an Elisha for others. Maybe you noticed, but in this story, Elisha doesn't always seem to know what to do. Or to say. And maybe that's how we feel at times when confronted by other people and their loss and their grief. But Elisha was there. Be there for others. Be there so that they can learn the real solution to the unnatural and ugly reality of death. Sit with them in their grief. Be the shoulder for them to cry on. And care enough to tell them that your God is unlike any other. He addresses your greatest needs with the gift of life. Amen. Please stand. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's now confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'll gather our thank offering. There's an offering plate on the small table in the back. If you're so moved, you may drop your offering in that plate at any time. If you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, it's important that you know you're not obligated to give an offering. We're simply happy to have you here and to share the word of God with you. Your gifts are certainly welcome, though, because this is one of the ways that we take this good news of Jesus out into our community. Also, during this time of offering, we'd kindly ask that everyone please sign the friendship registers that are located in the racks beneath the chairs at the center of each row.
Please stand for prayer. Prayers this morning are printed for you on pages 9 and 10. At the place for special prayers, we'll ask God to bless all those who are suffering because of the tornadoes in Mississippi this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just as you rescued and delivered your people at the Red Sea, so you have rescued and delivered us from sin and death through the perfect work of your Son. Just as you promised and returned your people to their homeland after captivity, so you have promised us that we have an eternal home in heaven. Just as you freed and formed your people to declare your praises throughout their lives, so you have given us wonderful opportunities to serve you and share your love with others. Just as you give us the comfort of knowing you hear and answer our prayers in Christ, so you also encourage us to pray for those who are sick, suffering, and struggling. Almighty God, we trust your word when you tell us that you use even trouble and difficulty for our eternal good. Bring that comforting promise to all those who are suffering because of the terrible tornado in Mississippi. Bless the re relief and recovery efforts there and bring strength and healing to those who need it. Remind your people of the victory they have over death so that even when there is loss of life, your people are safe in your hands and enjoy the blessings of eternal life. Use this time to draw your people closer to you so that they remember your grace revealed on the cross, so that they trust your promise to lead them and care for them always. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. With joy, we remember that your grace and your mercy and your love for us is new every morning. Strengthen our faith in you and let our lives always reflect your glorious gifts. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is printed on pages 10 and 11, The Old Rugged Cross. <laughs> 